Hello friends, Ginny D here, and today we are going to talk about flavor. And no, I'm not talking about the official D&D cookbook, although I do have a cooking show where I make recipes from it, so check it out in the cards. I'm talking about narrative flavor, thematic details that don't actually affect the mechanics of gameplay. In my opinion, flavor is one of the best parts of playing an imaginative role-playing game like D&D, and magic is one of the most fun places to show it off. So today, I'm going to walk you through how to come up with your own unique flavor for your spellcasting character. Before we get into the how-to, I just want to dig a little deeper into what flavor actually is. The simplest explanation is that flavor is any descriptive element that doesn't affect the mechanics of play. To be clear, you can flavor a lot more than just spellcasting. You can flavor how your character fights, what their armor or weapons look like, how they perform a check or a save. I just want to talk spells today because I think they're super fun to play with, but these suggestions could easily be adapted to flavor other elements of your gameplay. Also, flavor is already built into some spells. For example, when you cast Chill Touch, it's described right there in the handbook as a ghostly skeletal hand. The way that it looks doesn't have any effect on how you roll your ranged attack or how much damage you do. It's just flavor. But where it gets really fun is creating your own flavor. For example, when my warlock Ashling looks through the eyes of her familiar, Nightshade the Pseudo Dragon, I describe her own eyes going full black, iris and whites, with sort of an oil slick purple sheen like Nightshade's own scales. This is a visual that helps me and the other players at the table visualize what's happening and just makes this particular action feel cool and interesting. You don't even have to accept the flavor that the handbook provides, but one crucial part of all of this is that you need to communicate with your DM. Some DMs will be really open to flavor and others may prefer you to stick a little closer to what's in the handbook. Some may even allow you to change mechanics to suit the flavor, such as Matt Mercer and Critical Role, allowing Jester's Hellish Rebuke to deal cold damage instead of fire damage. Everything in this video is predicated on the assumption that you are in communication with your DM, okay? Okay, let's get started. Every spell has components listed, which are just the requirements to cast the spell. Components can be verbal, somatic, or material. These can be a great entry point for figuring out flavor. You might want to describe how you use these components, or if your spellcaster uses an arcane or divine focus, what that focus looks like and how they use that. Caleb in Critical Role is a great example of a very literal way to translate the listed components into flavor description. He always describes pulling a specific material item out of the component pouch, like bat guano for fireball, and then doing something with it, like rolling it in his fingers. It's a great narrative reminder that Caleb, as a wizard, is casting magic through study. He's practiced and prepared for and memorized all of the steps to cast a spell. Since my character Ashling is a warlock, she has an arcane focus, which she can use in place of components. So when she casts a spell, I often describe her as reaching up to hold the vial of soil that she wears around her neck, and then performing the somatic gestures with her free hand. For verbal components, ask yourself, what exactly is your character saying when they cast a spell? Maybe Ashling, since her patron is Fae, speaks her spells in Sylvan, the language of the Fae. If you play a bard, you may ask, what verbal component of hideous laughter is perceived by the target as being so funny? Speaking of which, allow me to shamelessly plug my Tasha's hideous laughter video from last week, which contains 50 terrible D&D jokes that would be perfect flavor for casting that spell. If a spell does damage, you can look to the damage type for ideas on how to flavor that damage. For example, if a spell does fire damage, where does that fire come from? How does it move? What color is it? Maybe your character speaks a few words of power and their material components ignite in their hand and then they toss it towards their target. When it hits, it explodes into a mass of arcane green flames. Or maybe they simply extend their hand to point at their target and the ground beneath them begins to glimmer with embers before snake-like streams of licking flames rise up from the earth to circle their body. Ashling's patron is a homebrew archfey called the Woman of the Soil. She has the spell Chill Touch, which deals necrotic damage. So to combine that death energy with the soil theme of her magic, I thought of grave dirt. I thought of people being buried in the ground. Instead of one big ghost hand like the spell describes, I imagine lots of crumbling little hands formed of dirt and rotting bits of plant matter, emerging from the ground and clutching at the target's feet and clothes, like they're trying to drag them down into the earth. If it suits your character, this might be a place that your DM could allow you to make changes to the damage type, as long as they don't think that it's going to seriously skew how effective the spell is. But that's starting to get into homebrew territory, which some DMs just may not be into, so remember that you can still flavor damage without actually making mechanical changes. If you want your multi-class wizard cleric to cast a fireball that appears as a glowing golden burst of divine energy, you can still describe it that way, even if it deals fire damage. 
If you're feeling like there is a lot to keep track of while playing D&D, I feel you. Not only is it hard to take notes while playing, but it's even harder to take notes that are organized enough to go back and reference later. That's why 1985 Games has sponsored this video to share their newest Kickstarter, Dungeon Notes. These simple little journals are designed to make it as easy as possible to take and revisit organized notes. There's a player's journal for your character sheet, spells, items, and session notes, complete with a customizable index, and even a little tracker for crafting or skill training where you can log how many hours you've put in towards specific goals. For DMs, you can use the session notes journal to keep track of your player's AC, passive perception, and max hit points, or to jot down stat blocks and sketch out maps. Plus, grab the campaign notes journal to keep track of larger scale info like your world's deities and factions, historical timelines, and important locations and NPCs. For more flexible or disposable notes, they have also designed these little sticky note pads so that DMs can keep track of things like initiative order or last minute NPCs, and players can easily keep tabs on hit points and spell slots session by session instead of constantly erasing and rewriting on your character sheet. If you've been interested in D&D journals before but found it difficult to justify the price point, especially for multiple characters, you are gonna love how accessible Dungeon Notes is. Check out their Kickstarter at the link in the description to learn more and make your own pledge. Most spells are available to multiple classes, but that doesn't mean the spell has to look the same when used by casters who draw their magic from very different sources. Thinking about where your class gets their magic can inform how they might cast each spell differently. For example, Pass Without Trace would probably look very different for a ranger than it looks for a druid. For a ranger, Pass Without Trace might mean that they're familiar enough with the land that they can lead their party through areas that are quieter or darker. They have a magically granted understanding of which plants will rustle loudly when disturbed, or which types of dirt will retain clear footprints, which animals will cry out when they see a person. Meanwhile, a druid's version of Pass Without Trace might mean that nature shapes itself around your party as they travel, twigs choosing to snap more quietly beneath your feet, a slight breeze causing the shadows of leaves to shift to conceal your passage. Ashling is a multi-class warlock druid, but she was a warlock first, and her druidic origin is still tied to her warlock patron, so I tend to flavor even her druid spells with sort of a dark, spooky, warlocky feel. You can also bring elements of your character's personality into how they cast spells. Are they really showy and attention-seeking? Maybe they speak their verbal components in a booming voice, make grand gestures. Maybe there are effects that come alongside the spell that are purely for show. Or if they're shy, they might whisper or mumble their verbal components and perform more subtle gestures. If they get angry easily, they might be the type to hurl their spells or deliver them with martial looking strikes. Or maybe the magic itself is red and orange and aggressive looking. If they're a very precise, detail-oriented person, their spellcasting might be very intricate or the magic might manifest itself in geometric patterns. If you're not sure what your character's personality is, I have a video to help with that. You can check it out in the cards. Aesthetic and theme can come into play here too. For example, Ashling has flowers growing from her hair, so when she wild shapes, there are also flowers growing from the fur or feathers of whatever creature she's turned into. Digging into your character's history can also inform their spellcasting. How did they learn these spells? If they learned magic in a school or in some sort of structured way, they might be methodical and do the same thing every time. A spellcaster like that might warm up each morning, practice their somatic movements in the evenings before bed. They may even mutter the memorized steps to themselves or count them as they cast. If their spell attack misses, it might be described as them forgetting or mispronouncing a word. Their community or geographic location can also have an impact. Maybe a caster who was raised in a seafaring community sings or chants their verbal components, like a sea shanty, a work song to time their rowing to. Or maybe a caster raised by a militant tribe or clan learned to channel their magic through weapons. Ashling learned her magic while living in a community that judged and shunned her adoptive mother who was labeled as a witch. So her magic in some ways comes from a place of shame. She's never gonna be a showy caster because she grew up believing that magic was something to hide and feel guilty about. I imagine this means that she speaks verbal components quietly. She probably hunches and turns away from people while making somatic gestures. 
In the end, as long as the mechanics stay the same, you do not have to do the same things that everyone else is doing. Have a perpetually sniffly character who casts spells by sneezing. Cast ranged spells by folding your components into a paper airplane and throwing it. Make all of your verbal components wordless yells. Cast spells through dance. Do whatever sounds fun and interesting to you. I feel like I always say this, but it's a game. And better yet, it's a game where we have total control over how it's played. So why not do crazy things? D&D is the absolute last place you should be thinking inside the box. I'd love to hear about how you flavor your spells and actions in the comments, and as always, if you have any tabletop gaming or character building questions that you would like me to answer, please let me know.